importance of rhythms and meaning, the purpose, the teleos, as we will sometimes use the word. Let's first of all begin with the spoken word. When we talk about the spoken word, we're talking about the word of God often referred to, will become an important part of our reading of the Bible. That phrase itself will become important. Here we find the preeminence of the spoken and later written word above buildings, which makes sense after the temple falls in 587, exile requires that these writings are created and redacted. Later, we'll hear from the Gospel of John in the first chapter, this mention of the word logos. We'll come to it later in a further lecture. Now, let's answer, maybe speculate on this question, what language did God speak to create the world? Of course, the simple answer is the language of God. But if you were to ask even further, well, what was that language? Uh, the One interesting answer is that the, the language was math, counting, number. For example, notice that right from the start, we're being taught about how to count, right? First day, second day, sixth day. Why, oh, now, why does this matter, in, in my estimation, uh, and in a lot of scholars' estimations? Because I think here we're learning about religion. That is, patterns, rhythms. I mean, to do anything religiously in English means just to do it over and over again, right, with some kind of purpose. It's significant that the Hebrew people uh, will someday focus everything on rhythms, as will all religious people on this planet. Everything begins and seems to begin and end with rhythms, repetitions. Why is this important? I think it gives the people who claim this God as their God and this text as their text a powerful notion. That is, there is teleos, there is meaning, there is purpose in the universe. The very idea of repetition, of rhythm, means you never see the world as chaotic. Even in the midst of the worst of pain, go and read, for example, Psalm 13. In the midst of the worst imaginable pain, where are you? Why have you abandoned me? Notice that psalm will finish with hope, some sense of purpose. There's always hope. This will be one of the greatest gifts, in my estimation, uh, to the world um, uh, of, uh, of the West, especially. We're, we're going to adopt this idea, and we're going to see it permeate so much of what goes on without even realizing it. Notice how often the word good gets used seven times. That is to say, life is good, and the argument that life is good, an optimistic or a positive view of existence. In the second creation account, we have another focus, I think. The creation of humans seems to be more central. Obviously, you can ask the question, which was created first, animals or humans? It's not an argument we're going to get into. Note the almost comic story of why animals are created, to find Adam a pal, basically, a partner. Notice as well how trees and rivers and gardens are central motifs in this account. The idea of Eden as paradise is first introduced here. The ideal will remain a part of many stories. Of course, you're thinking as well of El Dorado in the afterlife. The idea of heaven is actually in many ways born here. You can run this idea down on your own. Uh, Ezekiel 28, 13 through 16. Ezekiel 31, 8 through 9. Isaiah 51, 3. Joel 2, 3. To just take a look at the different ways this will already become influential later in your reading. The idea that trees are important, some have pointed out possibly feminine powers of fertility already in play here. Notice the tree of life in 322, again mentioned in Proverbs 318, Revelation 22:2, Revelation 22:14, as well as 19. Um, and we have, of course, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil symbolizing wisdom. 2 Samuel 14, 17, uh, 1 Kings 3, 9, we'll mention this. And obviously we're going to have a lot to say about this in our next lecture of uh, Genesis 3. There are some sacred trees as well, Genesis 12, 6 through 8, the Oak of Mora, at times uh, some may be think, related to an oracle giver, Genesis 13, 18, 8, Genesis 18, 1, Genesis 35, 4, as well as Deuteronomy 11, 30, Joshua 24, 26, Judges 9, 37, and of course remember later, Christ, we are told, will die on a tree. Note the Hebrew words for Adam, meaning humanity, for Eve, meaning life, these Two become symbols for the world. When we meet them again later in chapter 3, we'll have more to say about this one. Note that if you create woman out of a man, like Zeus giving birth to Athena out of his forehead, then you pay attention to where she came from, right? Note that the man's head or foot, not where she comes from, but rather his side. Is there some suggestion here already that men should see women as somehow they're equal? Hmm. Note the first poems of the Bible. 127, 223. Can you see any similarities between the two first poems of the Bible? 
Note the language of 216.17. It does le read kind of like legal prohibition, death penalty language. You can reference here Leviticus 29 as well as 20.11 and 12 for examples of this type of thing. As for the Sabbath and the importance of rest, you can run this one down with Exodus 20.11 and elsewhere. Some scholars have suggested that the creation of woman is here in this text is one of the only ones from the ancient Near Eastern literature. That's an interesting observation. You can do your own research to see if that's true or not. And what about chapter 2, verse 24? Is there seem to be some kind of divine intention for monogamy here? That already is an interesting question. And what do we want to say about these creation accounts? They seem to address major concerns about what it means to talk about existence. They raise topics that we'll see treated again later in the text. They place humans, notice, as central to the story of the world. Let's jump to level 2b really quickly. Notice in 127 you have the first poetry of an Old Testament where about, scholars say, 40% of the Old Testament is in fact poetry. Note the poetry as well in chapter 2, a song for a woman. Uh, this, um, this account will celebrate women right from the start. But does it always celebrate women? This will obviously be one of the questions that we will address as we study. At level 3a, we can ask about here relational ideas as we finish this lecture. What comes to mind here? American philosopher Ken Wilber's classic, Sex, Ecology, Spirituality, uh, um, begins actually with him pointing out uh, that there are two answers to the question, why is there something instead of nothing? Notice, either you wish to find an answer to this question, or you pretend like there is no real question here at all, what he calls the philosophy of oops. Whether you accept this creation account or not, Let's point out, we find an attempt here to answer the question, or do we? Does this text really tell us why there is something instead of nothing, or not? I'll leave it to you to think about. Another 3A observation, we might think about other cosmogonic stories. For example, we can study Native American creation stories and ask how they are similar or different. For example, it's possible in Native American stories there's not so much this idea that humans should subdue and dominate nature, but rather seek to live in accord with it in some way. We think, of course, of Taoist ideas here, don't we? The Tao Te Ching of living with nature, not against it. You might want to research the ways that scholars have pointed out how Genesis chapter 1 especially is a response to the Babylonian cosmogonic myth, the Numa Elish, and an extension in some ways to it, back to our comments about creating the great sea monsters, for example. Finally, let's work at level 3b. How does this text relate to you personally? Do you like one of the creation stories over the other? Do you see them as doing different kinds of things? Can you read them as a single story with different points of emphasis? Do you think that guys and gals can be pals, for example? Another question, if God is perfect and in need of nothing, an idea associated, for example, in Acts 17.25, later we'll study this passage, usually associated with God, the idea that gods are perfect and don't need anything, then why create in the first place? Is it true that all acts of creation involve some kind of need? Well, for what need did God create? For example, was God lonely? None of this is provided for us in this text, and yet we can speculate. This text seems to suggest that the world when it was created was a good world. Do you think of the world as good, as very good? Or was it once very good and then it stopped being good? We'll obviously have to have this discussion when we meet chapter 3 in a bit. Do you think there's anything important about seeing the world as good or bad? There seems to be two views here, by the way. One says that the world was once an Eden and then it became ruined in some way, fallen, broken, and our quest is to somehow get back to this state of nature that Rousseau will talk about and other thinkers as we, as we move down the line. Or the other view is a more evolutionary view, and it says the world starts somehow, either creation or Big Bang or whatever, and then is improving or getting better, and it is the job of humans to try to improve the world in some way, sometimes referred to as the up from Eden model. Finally, notice the last verses of chapter 2. One of the great questions, the, what we'll call the William Blake question, the, Ameri the, the English romantic poet, um, the question of innocence versus experience when we study Blake, Songs of Innocence, Songs of Experience. In the next chapter, we'll tell the story that will outline this kind of dynamic tension. Question, which is better, to be innocent and ignorant or experienced and have knowledge? 
I like to point out the ways in which a simple reading of this text can raise so many dynamic questions. And as we begin to then read in other texts in Western thought and literature, we'll begin to make these connections, I hope. When we come back, we're going to pick up one of the most famous sections from Genesis, the Genesis 3 account of what is often referred to as the story of the fall. We'll talk about that story, the famous story of eating of the forbidden fruit. Of course, the most famous rendition of this outside of the biblical text will be Milton's Paradise Lost, and we'll come back to mention that one. Thank you. I hope that this lecture has at least helped you to pick up the reading.